Today we are finishing our message series on Judges. And you might be asking yourself, well, I thought we did that last week because we finished the book of Judges last week. But as we saw in the book of Judges, it did not end well for the people of Israel. It ended on a really, really sad, depressing note. It was not pleasant. And so I made the decision when we were preparing for these messages last fall to go ahead and add in a final week because I don't want this series to end on such a depressing note. Last week was probably one of the hardest sermons I've ever preached in 20 years of ministry. It was really, really difficult. It was hard to prepare. It was hard to deliver. It was hard to hear because um, it is essentially what happens when a people who God called reject him and how far they can go in their decision-making process to redefine re right and wrong, how far away from God they can get to those things. So um, I wanted to add in one final week to kind of um, end everything, this entire story, on a hopeful note, but also because there are two more judges in the history of Israel that are not included in the book of Judges. That is a guy named Eli, and that is a guy named Samuel. So what we're going to do is we're going to finish our Judges series today learning about those two guys in the first three chapters of the book of First Samuel. But while we read through Judges, I just want to remind um, everybody that the path that we saw Israel go through, by the end of Judges, the people in that book were essentially the grandchildren of the Exodus. And since the Bible is not necessarily chronological, it's hard to follow and put things together and figure out what came in what order. Um, so it's really important for us to, to remind ourselves that the story of the book of Judges came right after the book of Joshua, and Joshua came right after the story of the Exodus. So really what we have is the people in Judges are the grandchildren of the Exodus. So their grandparents, they watched God part the Red Sea. The people in Judges, their grandparents watched God part the Red Sea. And their parents watched Joshua part the, Red, or part, uh, the Jordan River. When they finally moved into the land, they had a pretty, pretty deep well of people who had experiences with God. Their grandparents had these amazing ones. I mean, I mean, they wandered in the desert, which was not pleasant, but they saw some pretty amazing miracles. And their parents fought with Joshua and took over the land, but they finally come into the land and they have quickly forgotten God. And that idea of the people of Judges reminds me of a quote that I heard a theologian once say, and he said that if one generation knows the Lord, their children assume the Lord, and their grandchildren forget the Lord. And the idea is that if you don't consciously teach your children to love the Lord the way that you love the Lord, then as they grow, they will just assume that their relationship with God comes from whatever your relationship with God was. And as they have children and start raising up kids, they actually don't have a relationship with God. They were leaning on yours. So they have nothing to pass down for their kids. And if you don't do the work to make sure that you teach the Word of God and provide moments within your family where they can catch the Word of God being applied in different situations, you're going to see the love of God in your family die off in just two generations. That happens over and over. And so the warning from the book of Judges is very strong to us because if this was true for Israel, it can also be true for us. And that warning from Judges 21 reminds us that if we don't do the work to obey God and we do these things like Israel did to redefine right in our own eyes and allow sin to be passed down, that, that cycle is going to continue generation over generation over generation. We think that it's not a big deal uh, if we don't take the Word of God seriously, if we don't try to apply it, or if we don't spend time trying to figure out what is God saying and how do we apply to our lives, or, or if this theology is really, really important. If we don't take the time to do that, then eventually you're not going to be able to pass it on to your kids, and they're going to miss it. And the bad habits that you pick up and you start doing as a family now, your kids are going to pick up. And their kids are going to think, well, this is just normal. This is what we've always done. And eventually the things that God says for us to take seriously will not be taken seriously in your family. And do you know why? It's because you decided not to take it seriously. That's the warning from Judges. 
Nobody in Judges is walking around saying, you know what, what is the most wicked thing that I could possibly do today? Everybody in Judges is walking around saying, I don't necessarily think this is a wicked thing, but it seems like the right thing to do in my own eyes. That's the big issue. It's not us as a people saying, God, I'm going to reject you. It's us as a people saying, I think I know better. And if you allow that kind of structure to, be, to, to form within your home, where you make the decision to define, excuse me, to define right and wrong rather than God, that's going to continue generation to generation to generation. But that leaves an unbelievable, ho- hopeless feeling. And it may seem like, um, well, now we just have tied God's hands because we are the rebellious people and he can't do anything. But that's not the case. That is a warning you should watch out for. And there are repercussions for you redefining right in your own eyes and rejecting God. But that is not the end of the story. God loves his people so much that even if you do that and pass down wickedness through through generations without even realizing it, that does not mean that God will not intervene in your grandkids. You follow? Be aware of the warning that your choices have impacts generationally. But also know that there is a hope in this word of God, that God loves his people so much that even though you do that, he will supersede your wicked decisions or your poor choices, and he will intervene in your kids' lives anyway. That's the good news, which is the reason why I wanted to introduce 1 Samuel today. Because at the end of Judges, there's no repentance. There's no um, turning away from their, per- their personal sin. There's no saying, um, you know what, we did some, some pretty wicked things. There was just sin upon sin upon sin upon sin. So you would think that that's kind of the end of the story, but that's not. As soon as Judges closes, we open up on the book of 1 Samuel, and we see that even in the middle of Israel's unfaithfulness, God is unbelievably faithful. So today, I want to finish up this series by showing you God's faithfulness in the middle of man's rebellion. Because that's probably one of the most applicable things for your life today. The reality that even though you do choose wickedness and you struggle with things inside your heart, God is still faithful to not give up on you, but reach out and make a difference. That's what I want to remind you. So, As we study God's faithfulness, I want it to fill your heart with hope today, because in the middle of some of the darkest periods of Israel's history, there was one woman who prayed one prayer, and God used it to shift the entire nation. You ready to hear the story? All right, so this is it. This is the reason why we're doing this today. I'm reading this story to you because I want you to hear hope. Last week was really sad, but that's not how it ends. There's hope in this story. So let's pick it up in 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 1. Now there was a certain man of Ramathiam Zophim, of the hill country of Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son, of, the son of Jeroam, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuth, an Ephrathite. Now he had two wives. The name of one of his wives was Hannah, and the name of the other was Peninnah. Now, Peninnah had children, but Hannah had no children. Now, this man, uh, Elkanah, he used to go up year by year from his city to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of hosts at Shiloh. Now, what was in Shiloh? We'll pause there. Shiloh is where the tabernacle was. Now, do you remember um, when God gave the Ten Commandments to Moses? On on that mountain, he also gave Moses instructions on how to build a place of worship, and it was called the tabernacle or the tent of meeting. And it was this big, long, rectangle tent was surrounded by a huge fence, and inside of it were these pieces of furniture that God had instructed Israel to use for worship. There was an Ark of the Covenant. There was uh, an altar of incense. There was a table where the priests would lay bread. There was a whole process that the priests would use to uh, facilitate worship in Israel, and it was at the city of Shiloh. So this guy used to bring his two wives and his, and his family down to this place for worship. And at this place were uh, this guy named Eli, who was a priest and a judge, and his two sons, Hophni and Phinehas. They were priests of the Lord. And this is where we pick up in verse 4. On the day when Elkanah sacrificed, so every year when he would go up and do this, he would give portions to Peninnah, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion. What does that mean? 
That means when they're sitting around the table eating, he would always give Hannah an extra scoop of mashed potatoes because she didn't have any children. This guy was clueless. This guy was just clueless. The hurt inside of his wife because she couldn't have kids, he thought he could fix by making sure that everybody in the room saw that he loved her more. Now, what do you think that did with his other wife? It it wasn't pleasant. (laughs) That's the answer. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her, though the Lord had closed her womb. And her rival, Peninnah, used to provoke her grievously to irritate her because the Lord had closed her womb. The other wife would pick on her because she couldn't have kids. So it went one year, as often as they went up to the house of the Lord, she would provoke her. So she did this not just one year, she'd do it every year. Therefore, Hannah wept and would not eat. And Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? Why is your heart so sad? Am I not more to you than ten sons? Is it enough that I've married you and this other woman for you not to be sad? Is it enough that I give you extra mashed potatoes when we sit down at the table? Isn't that enough? Aren't I enough? Now, this story starts off right at the end of where we were in Judges. And this story um, highlights very, uh, in, in the same way the end of the five chapters of Judges did, where we're zooming in on a specific family. And the people in this story are very similar because they have adopted the same culture. You've got this guy named Elkanah, and he has two wives, something that God never told them to do, but the surrounding cultures did, and they kind of adopted. And so this guy thinks that, well, I can go down and worship the Lord, but also I can bring my two wives with me. Like the, I don't really sure how they reconciled that, but they did, and it was a way that they did things. And we're about to learn that not only was this family all bizarre, but Eli, the priest judge, and his two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, were not on the up and up either. They were pretty wicked dudes too. So this entire story is set in the middle of a culture that is very similar to judges. Husbands are treating their wives with disrespect. Wives are treating their other wife and laws with disrespect. The priests are not respecting God's laws. The priest's sons are doing some pretty wicked things, and we'll get to them in a minute. But in the middle of the story, the book highlights this girl named Hannah. Now, Hannah was a woman who could not have children, and we have to understand why that's a big deal. Why was it a big deal for her not to have kids? Well, because um, a couple reasons. First, Israel's culture was all about farming. So if you didn't have kids, as you grew older, there was nobody to work the farm. So if you didn't have kids, then your family business essentially stopped. That's one reason why it was difficult uh, for someone to not have kids, emotionally, for that to be a scar for a woman not to have kids. Another one was in Israel, there's no 401k plans. There's no retirement plans. Your retirement plan is your kids. Now, I know this is foreign in America, because when, when, when people get old, like we pay other people to take care of them. We don't take care of our family. That's not what we do here. But in this culture, that's what they did. There's no old folks' homes that you send grandma to. She lives with you. Some of you are like, wow, that's a nightmare. Mother-in-laws too. Father-in-laws, they all come and live under the same roof. Why do you have kids? So that as you grow older, someone is going to take care of you because your eyesight is going to fail. Your mind is not going to be as sharp as it used to be. And you can't get up and scoot around like you used to. So you need your kids to care for you. That's another one. But the other one is Israel had to survive. If other nations want to come in and defeat Israel, who's going to fight against them? People. You need people in your armies. And in order to have armies, you've got to have these kids who are going to grow up and be in the armies. And so, uh, one of the, according to these three reasons, there's a lot of pressure on Hannah to have kids. And the fact that she couldn't in this culture was a huge issue for her. It brought her to a place of depression where she wouldn't even eat and people were picking on her. And she's essentially surrounded by a culture 
that just did what was right in their own eyes. They didn't honor and respect her. They didn't, um, they didn't care for her because of something that was completely out of her uh, choice. She, she didn't choose this for herself. This is something that God had established for her, and she couldn't have kids. No one cared for her feelings or her emotions. All they cared about was the fact that they wanted theirs. They defined what was right. And what was right was you got to have kids, and you can't, so that's on you. So her husband married two women. Her wife-in-law is picking on her constantly, and Eli is a wicked man with some wicked kids. And in this story, we've got Hannah who's called out. She can't have kids. And it's at this point we should ask ourselves, all right, then why is the book of 1 Samuel starting off with Hannah's story? Why does Hannah matter? In a culture of people who do whatever they want and think that it's right and have rejected God, why does someone like Hannah get her own story called out in the first two chapters. Well, you're going to find out in a minute in verse 9, but it's because Hannah has faith when everyone around her does not. And that's important. Because the thing that sets Hannah apart is not the fact that she can have kids. The thing that sets Hannah apart is not that she made the decision to not marry some loser who wanted to marry two wives. The thing that sets Hannah apart in her culture is her faith. And it's an important reminder for us for what sets us apart in our culture. See, what sets you apart as a Christian in this culture is not your morality. It's not the fact that you don't do some things that other people in the world don't do. Because you can find non-believers who choose not to participate in sin. They have other sins that they struggle with. But if your whole sense of identity is, well, I don't do these things, you're missing what it means to be a Christian. The thing that makes you unique in this world and makes you different from the rest of the world is that you are a person of faith. You put your faith in something completely outside of this world. Now, everybody has been given a measure of faith by God when we're born, and we have a decision on where to put that faith. Some people put that faith in the world system. Some people put their faith in their own ability to be able to produce and get a job and make a lot of money. But the people of faith like us, we put that faith that God has given us back into him, and that is what makes Hannah unique. And what God likes is to find people who are seen by the culture as weak, because they have faith, and use them to bring big changes. And what's about to come is a huge shift in Israel. When you read through Judges, it's easy to think, God has forgotten these people, or he's had enough, or he said, you guys are so rebellious, I'll I'll go pick a different people. But that's not what happens. In the middle of this, God is looking to and fro, and he's looking for the people of faith, and he's looking for the weakest of the culture, and he's looking for those who say, I've had enough of this nonsense in this life. Isn't there something better from you? Isn't there something that I can tap into from your kingdom that is better than all of this? I've had this and this, and all of it is letting me down. Isn't there something better? He's looking for those people because he likes to use those people to bring big change because when it happens, nobody says, man, Hannah had a lot of wealth, and she knew a lot of people, and when she had, did that thing, man, we need more Hannahs. No, nobody says that, because Hannah's too weak to do anything on her own. God uses people who are too weak to do anything or on their own, so that when it does come about, everybody knows that it was God. Because if it wasn't, that person was too weak to get anything done. So that's why Hannah is, stands out here, because she is a person of faith, in a culture that has no faith, and she is the weakest among that culture, and God is going to use her to bring about big change. Let's go to verse 9. After they had eaten and drunk in Shiloh, Hannah rose. We'll come back to that, but that's an important word, the way she, she did this. Eli the priest was sitting on the seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord, and she was deeply distressed, and she prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. So after dinner, she got up, she went down to the temple, and she is just she is just letting it all out. Emotionally, she is just crying and praying and asking God to intervene. She vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on my affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life and no razor shall touch his head. She's 
essentially saying, God, if you answer my prayer, I'll give this boy back to you and he will be a Nazarite. I'll, I'll, I'll sign him up for the covenant that you gave Moses as a way to be dedicated as a priest unto you. And he won't drink any alcohol and he won't cut his head and he will dedicate his entire life to your service. As she continued to pray before the Lord, Eli observed her mouth, and Hannah was speaking in her heart, only her lips were moved, and her voice was not heard. And therefore, Eli took her to be a drunk woman. And Eli said to her, how long will you go on being drunk? Put away your wine from you. But Hannah answered her and said, no, my Lord, I am a woman troubled in spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have been pouring out my soul before the Lord." Do not regard your servant as a worthless woman, for all along I have been speaking out of my great anxiety and vexation. And then Eli said, go in peace, and the God of Israel grant your petition that you have made to him. And she said, let your servant find favor in your eyes. And the woman went her way and ate, and her face was no longer sad. Now, before we touch that, let's go back to verse 9. Verse 9, Hannah rose up and went to pray. That word rose in Hebrew essentially means to become powerful, to become fixed on something, to make a decision that it's time to do something um, about whatever the situation is. And from this situation, what we have is Hannah, who is completely powerless. She doesn't have the capacity or the ability to be able to have children or change anything about her circumstances, but she does have one thing. She has her faith. And she makes a decision at this point to put some feet to her faith. She's going to act on her faith. She's going to ask God to intervene and do something about something that she can't do anything about. And her act of faith changed her life. She prays a prayer basically that says, look, I have no power to change this, but please will you change this for me? And if you answer my prayer, I will honor you. Now at this point, we should probably talk about the way she prayed because it would, you would see, it, it it would seem um, that reading through this, that what she's doing here is she's making a deal with God. If you do this, then I will do that. God answers her prayer, so it's probably not what's happening here. And it's not a good practice to do that. In your prayer life, don't make it a habit of saying, God, if you do this, man, I'll really do this. I'll start showing up to church and I'll read my Bible more if you really do this one thing. God's not interested in those kind of prayers. And that's not really what she prayed. What she's praying here is a first fruits kind of a prayer. Now, let me explain this principle. Hannah's not making a deal here. What she's doing is she's using a biblical principle that God had established with Moses um, through the tithe, which is kind of like a first fruits principle. So the idea is that you are supposed to give of the first fruits of everything that comes in. Uh, let's say you're a farmer and you plant a bunch of corn. Um, the first corn that comes up, you don't take that corn to market. You take that corn and you give it to the Levites as an offering. And that act, the purpose of it, was to um, let everyone else around you, but also affirm inside of your heart that this is the first corn that came in, but I'm so confident that it will not be the last corn that comes in that I can actually take this and just give it away. Because I know if God brought this, he will absolutely bring more. See, before this first corn, I didn't have anything. And the fact that he could bring something out of nothing proves to me that I know he can bring more somethings out of nothing. So I don't have to take this first and consume it. I can give it away as a way to honor God and tell him, I trust you not just for the first thing that came in, but for more. That's the tithing principle. That's how we give within the church. That was borrowed in the New Testament when the, the, the apostles start setting up how organized church should operate on a regular basis. There's this concept of taking up offerings and giving tithes and supporting other churches. And it was borrowed from this culture in Israel of the tithe. This is how Israel is supposed to live. You never take the first fruits, the first tenth. You don't take that and consume it. You take it and you give it away as a way of reminding your soul where it came from, but also showing your family that if this came, more can come. I have no problem giving because the first I didn't have anyway, and now that it's here, I can give it away and know that God's going to increase. So what she's doing here is she's saying, God, if you give me a kid, I promise that I will dedicate him to you as a way to honor you, knowing that if you gave me one when I couldn't have any, you're going to give me more. 
Now, spoiler alert, it happened. She has many more kids after she gets pregnant with this child. But the thing about this prayer that is so in, important for us to um, see at the very end of it here is not the fact that she prayed in a first fruits prayer kind of way, which is, that's, that's cool. But the thing for me that I want to stand out to you is in verse 18. What happens when the priest told her that her prayer was going to be answered? Let your servant find favor in your eyes. And the woman went her way and ate, and her face was no longer sad. Now, why is that important? Well, it's important Because what doesn't happen is Hannah prays, the priest says, you're going to have a child, then she goes and gets pregnant, and then she stops being sad. What happens is she prays, God says, you're going to have a kid, and then she stops being sad, and then she gets pregnant. Why is that so important? Because it points us to this really important principle of where your joy comes from. What I mean is all of us can experience joy when our prayers are answered, right? It's nice to know that when you pray, you can see God doing things. That's awesome. But there is an even greater joy, and according to the Word of God, the kind of joy that can erase depression and sadness. It can erase the, the mocking of people around you. When your prayer, your, your joy, comes from knowing that when you pray, God hears you before you even see the fruit of the answered prayer. You see the difference? One, your joy comes from seeing the thing that God gave because you prayed, and the other comes from just knowing that God heard your prayer. Now, for some of us, that's not enough. And if it's not, I hate to say it, but that's a sign of your maturity. Because what happens if you pray and God doesn't answer in your timing? Or what happens if you pray and God says no? Then your joy being tied to seeing the answered prayer is going to be delayed and you're going to continue to walk long-faced and depressed because you can't see the gift of the answered prayer. But... If you can live in such a way that you don't need to see the answered prayer before you transform on the inside, then you're living in a completely different realm than the way that the rest of the world does. The world has a response when they see something physical take place that they didn't see before. But the people of God live by faith, and we have a response of joy before we even see that thing take place. We know that God heard us and and actually, what makes us most happy is not even having an answer to our prayer. It's knowing that God hears our prayer and that he is such a good father that he, whatever his decision would be, is the right decision. And I don't need to have a yes right now or a no right now. Just the sheer fact that I know that the God of the universe heard my prayer is enough to get me up out of the sadness that I've been living in. That's huge. Now, now that's... That's like advanced level course Christianity stuff. That's not stuff that's talked about and practiced on a regular basis. And the reason why is because it's the kind of thing that you start understanding once you start maturing in your faith. That's not the kind of thing that a young Christian is going to understand because they still have parts of their life tethered to this world and they're constantly being cut back and saying, oh, no, I wanted that, but no, I don't need that. And so the idea that their joy is not tied to seeing something happen is kind of a foreign concept. But I'm telling you that as you mature in Christ, knowing that God loves you is the kind of thing that, that reshapes your entire way and see. So what happens is when you start praying, you, you, you think, all right, I've got this thing that's overwhelming me and I, I, it's affecting my emotions and I'm really sad about it and I don't know what to do with it because it's out of my control. I guess I need to go pray. When you go in and you start praying, God, change this. What happens as you mature, is God starts pouring himself out on you in that place of prayer, and you leave that prayer, place of prayer, not with an answered prayer, but the realization that what you needed when you walked in there wasn't an answer to the prayer. What you needed was him. 
And when you can get to the place where you realize that you don't actually need anything else, all you ever really needed was Him, now you're making some progress. Because as long as your joy is tied to stuff, then you're going to consistently struggle with that same thing the disciples struggle. That, that, that really, the benefit of being around, being around with Jesus is, is the stuff He can do. I like hanging around Jesus because, man, he, he feeds everybody. He's healing sick people. He's raising people from the dead. But what would happen if Jesus never did another thing for you in your entire life? Would it be enough that he just loved you and died for you? What if he never intervened on anything ever again, but he made a way? Would that be enough? That's not the only thing he's doing. He is doing 10,000 Things that you will never know about on your behalf because he loves you. But what if you were never aware of any of that stuff ever again? Would it still, the knowledge of who he was and that he hears your prayers, is that enough to pull you up out of the sadness? And this story continues in verse 19 that it was enough to pull her out of her sadness. She changed her entire demeanor before she actually saw the answered prayer. Just knowing that it was going to be answered was enough. And from 119 down to 211, she gives birth to a boy named Samuel. She worships the Lord. She dedicates Samuel to God's work like she promised. And she leaves him with this guy named Eli. Now, after that, Hannah has many other kids, and Samuel grows up under Eli's um, uh, tutelage, and he sees Eli as a father figure. But Eli was a priest, and as we saw in the beginning of chapter 1, he was a judge, and he was also a father. He had two boys, and he was kind of a lousy father. And you start seeing how lousy of a father in around verse 12 of chapter 2 when the writer of 1 Samuel starts talking about what kind of worthless men these two boys were. These two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, they would steal food as people would bring it as to the offering. So you and your family, you've been setting aside this offering the entire year. You bring it up, and before you even set it on the altar to offer it to the Lord, Hophni and Phinehas are coming up, and they're cutting off the best steaks off of this offering, and they're eating it for themselves. The Bible also says that they were um, having um, sex with women in the tabernacle. They were having relations with the girls that would come and worship there. These, these boys had no respect for God, and they just did what they thought was right in their own eyes. And this is the culture that Samuel's growing up with. Now, Eli tried to deal with his sons. He went to them and he talked with them, but the problem with sin is that the closer to it, the more you excuse it. Let me explain what I mean. When we see sin in the lives of other people around us, people out in the world, What we often do is we take it very seriously. We have very little grace for people that we don't know and sin that we're not acquainted with. If I see sin in the lives of this politician or this person that I see out in public, man, I I am the judgment of God. I, I can execute some righteous judgment when I see sin out there. But if I see sin in the lives of my friends, uh, well... I'm more willing to make some excuses for it. Well, he's in his process. He's God's transforming. He's, he's got some time still. He's, God's still working on him. Just, give him. just give him a little more time. I have a different reaction to people that, that I know. But if you take it a next step further and beyond just someone I don't know and f- friends, when it gets into family, I don't just make excuses. I tend to start ignoring it. Well, that's just who they are. But no, don't, don't. Don't discipline my kid. No, uh-uh. no, no, don't, don't, don't say that about my family members. I don't care if you're right. That's my family. See what I'm saying? The closer the sin gets, the more excuses we make for it. And by the time it's inside of you, you don't just make excuses for it or ignore it. By the time it's in here, we're usually completely blind to it. And this was Eli's problem. He knew his boys were doing wicked and that their job required them to not be wicked. And he went and talked to them about it. But when they refused to change, he didn't remove them from their posts. He didn't discipline them. And the reason why is because the closer sin is to you, the more you're willing to excuse it, ignore it, or be completely blind to it. 
which is the reason why you need other people around you in the context of community to help you see things that you can't see about yourself. Because there are blind spots in your life, in your family, and with your friends that you don't even know are there. Or you know they're there and you choose to ignore it. But when you get into a context of community, you have people who are all filled with the Holy Spirit and we have a desire to be able to encourage each other. We are more willing in love to be able to call out stuff that needs to be corrected when we choose to ignore it. So God sent this prophet at the end of chapter two, to Eli. And essentially what the prophet said was, look, judgment is coming to your house. Whether you like it or not, God has had enough. And he's going to cut off your family lineage and you will no longer be a judge or a priest. Let's pick up the story in chapter three, verse one. Now this boy, Samuel, he was ministering to the Lord in the presence of Eli. And the Lord of the, excuse me, the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no frequent vision. That's probably the reason why Eli thought that Hannah was drunk when she was praying, because it had been a long time since he saw anyone pray. So the word of the Lord was rare. God wasn't speaking much. But this boy, Samuel, whose mama was Hannah, that she dedicated him to the Lord. He was a young boy growing up. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his own place, and the lamp of God had not yet gone out. So he wasn't dead yet, but he was close to it. And Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. So we're talking the ark of the covenant. We're talking the, the box, the angels, the presence of God. Inside of it is a copy of the Ten Commandments, Aaron's ro- ro- uh, rod that budded. We're talking manna. This is the coolest thing ever. And, and Samuel was like taking a nap next to it. Forgive me, like I'm, this, this chapter really just gets me excited. This is like my top 10 favorite chapters of all time. This little boy, all right, so just bear with me. You've got the culture of judges. You've got men treating women like garbage. You've got people treating kids like they're disposable. It is the worst period in Israel up to this date. God is not speaking. The priests are wicked. And you've got one girl who prays one prayer. A child is born. And this kid grows up and God chooses to speak to him. If there was ever a sign of hope, this chapter is in. I walked you through the darkest season of Israel's history, and where does the Lord choose to speak? To a little boy. I don't care how dark things seem for you right now. Emotionally, physically, I don't care. The Word of God promises that there is a light in the darkness. It may be small, it may be just a little boy who doesn't know any better, but I promise you there is a light when you pray with faith. The lamp of God not yet gone out, Samuel was lying down in the temple where the Lord was, where the ark of God was. In verse 4, then the Lord called to Samuel. This is the first time that God speaks. Up until this point, Israel made decisions based off of this thing called the Urim and the Thummim. Priests wore this robe, and inside of it, there was essentially a little black rectangle and a white rectangle. And whenever they would ask God, God, what do you think about this stuff? They'd toss these things on the table, and a yes or no would pop up, and that's how they would do things. But this is one of the first times since Moses, since the point back on the mountain where God actually speaks Audibly, he calls out to Samuel. He's calling out in the middle of the darkest period. God says, Samuel, Samuel, Samuel. This is huge, people. This is huge. Why is this so huge? Because we're living in the kind of darkness that they talked about in Judges. That's our day right now. And there are people of God who choose to use their faith to bring the kingdom of God here to this dark world. And God is calling out to you right now, Samuel, Samuel. The Holy Spirit is speaking to you just like God spoke to Samuel. I want you to stand up and do something on my behalf in this world. I'm going to tell you what to say, and I want you to go say it. This is still happening today. 
And we shut our ears to it. We pretend like, well, I don't really know what, well, whatever God's going to say, he's going to say within church. No, this is the dark. We're, we're walking in very dark times. And God is calling out to you just like he called out to Samuel. Samuel, Samuel. Now this first time, he got up, verse 5, he ran to Eli and said, here I am, you called me. But he said, I didn't call you, go lay down. So he went and laid down. Eli was so dense, he didn't even know what was happening. And the Lord called again, Samuel. And Samuel rose and went to Eli and said, here I am, for you called me. But he said, I didn't call you, my son, go lay down again. And Samuel did not yet know that it was the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. And the Lord called Samuel again a third time, and he rose, and he said, here I am. He went to Eli, and he called. And then, finally, Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Why did it take him three times? Because the word of the Lord was rare in these days. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes, and God stopped speaking. Therefore, Eli said to Samuel, go, lie down, and if he calls you again, say, speak, Lord, for your servant hears. So Samuel went and laid down in his place, and the Lord came and stood, calling at a, as, uh, as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, speak for your servant hears. And then the Lord said to Samuel, behold, I'm about to do a thing in Israel at which the two ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. On that day, I will fulfill against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. And I declare to him that I am about to punish his house forever for the iniquity that he knew because his sons were blaspheming God and he did not restrain them. Therefore, I will swear to the house of Eli and to the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be atoned for by sacrifice or offerings forever. So Samuel laid in his bed until morning. And then he opened the doors of the house of the Lord, and Samuel was afraid to tell the vision to Eli. But Eli said to Samuel, Samuel, my son. And he said, here I am. And Eli said, what was it that God told you? Don't hide it from me. Or may God do to you and more also if you hide anything from me of all that he told you. So Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. And he said, it is the Lord. Let him do what he seems good to him. And from that day forward, Samuel grew and the Lord was with him. And let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel from Dan to Beersheba knew that Samuel was established as a prophet of the Lord. And the Lord appeared again at Shiloh. And the Lord revealed himself to Samuel at Shiloh by the word of the Lord. Samuel became a judge and a prophet, and this is the beginning of a new generation in Israel being raised up. I wanted to read this story because in this story, God is using the weakest people in this culture. He's using the women and the children, the ones who have been marginalized and taken advantage of the most. He uses them to bring about some of the greatest change. What kind of change are we talking about? Well, we're talking about the change of Samuel growing up to be the prophet who crowns the next king of Israel. Samuel's the guy who actually crowned David king of Israel. Samuel is the guy who wrote the book of Judges. Samuel is the guy who wrote the first half of 1 Samuel that chronicled David coming to power. And then the prophets Nathan and Gad came after that. But up until this point, you don't see prophets being used by God in this way. And all of this takes place. David comes to become king because Samuel comes in and anoints him king and says, you are going to be the next king of Israel in the middle of all his brothers. This is a turning point in the history of Israel. And God chose to use a woman who had faith and a little boy in the midst of some of the darkest culture we have ever seen. Now, as we finish this series, I feel like it's important for us to talk just for a minute about what it means to hear the voice of God today, because that's really the way that God shifted things. He started using his voice. Now, in this, God is speaking audibly, 
And in the New Testament, we see God speaking in different interesting ways. One of the first is in John 16, 12, 13. We, we talk about the Holy Spirit. And Jesus says, look, um, the Holy Spirit is a way that God speaks through you. The Holy Spirit is on the inside of you. He is resided on the inside of you. You get the Holy Spirit when you get saved. The moment you are transformed and saved, the Holy Spirit comes on the inside of you. He resides in you. And he is essentially the promise, the mark that the promise is going to be fulfilled, that you are a Christian. He's one of the signs that it's true. And the Holy Spirit on the inside of you speaks to you in interesting and unique ways. Sometimes it feels just kind of like a leading or a prompting or something that you just know this is what God wants me to do. There's a, there's a peace or there is an affirming inside here and there's no other way to explain it until you've experienced it. There's just a thing in here where you just know this is what God wants me to do. How do you know? I just know. That's the Holy Spirit bearing witness inside of you, and it's an affirming inside. The other, another way the Holy Spirit can speak is in the forms of dreams or visions. While you're sleeping, God can speak to you in dreams. He can, he can, while you're in a time of worship or when you're reading the Bible, sometimes you'll just have a picture inside of your mind and it just kind of comes out of nowhere, and it's this vision. This is something that happened in all throughout the New Testament. Um, this is one of the ways that God told Peter uh, that uh, it was okay to start eating um, uh, uh, meat, that, that, was, that they were not allowed to eat as Jewish people. Another way that the Holy Spirit speaks is uh, very similar to the way that you have thoughts kind of come into your head. You can feel the Holy Spirit speaking to you in the same way that you have thoughts and um, uh, ideas coming into your head. Uh, but I would uh, warn you that when you are trying to decide whether this thing that you've had a vision from or a dream or this thought or this, uh, this prompting inside of your heart, how do you actually know that it's God and it's not you or it's not the enemy? One of the things that you do is you judge it against what the next way that God speaks is through the Bible. You never take something that you feel like God is saying to you and refuse to weigh it against what the Word of God says. Never do that. Our baseline for what is right and true is this Bible, the Word of God. Everything's weighed against that. So if, if the Holy Spirit is telling you something that's against this, that's not the Holy Spirit. That's not God speaking to you. That's your flesh. And you have responsibility to shut that stuff up. You submit those thoughts. You submit them to, to Jesus. You say, all right, no, I'm, I'm, I'm rejecting that. I'm submitting that because that's me, and I don't want that flesh uh, polluting my mind. How do I know that it's me and it's not the Word of God? It goes against the Word of God. Now, the Bible, uh, Matthew 4, uh, 4, Psalm 119, 105, we have these uh, uh, affirmations that the, the written text, the actual Word of God, this Bible that was written by eyewitness accounts of Jesus and, and encounters with other people that they had with God, this contains everything that God has chosen to reveal Himself about. There is nothing that God is going to reveal to you or to anybody on the earth that is outside of this Bible, that is some new thing that just came out of nowhere, that's not going to happen. Everything that God has decided to reveal about himself to us is already included in here. There is nothing new out there that somebody's going to come across that I got something you ain't never heard before. When that happens, that person is operating in the spirit of the Antichrist, and you ignore everything that they're saying. Because what they're trying to do is get you to join a cult. You don't want any part of that, trust me. Weigh everything against this, which comes back to, well, how do I know? Well, you got to read this. You have to know this. So outside of the Holy Spirit speaking, outside of the Bible, another way that God loves speaking is through the church. Colossians 3, 16 and 17, God has commanded a group of people to come together on a regular basis. There's a, a global expression and there's a local expression of the church. And when we come together, God speaks through each, in, uh, each one of us. He uses our giftings. And in the body of the local church, we hear God speaking to us. And if you're not in connecting with a local church body, then you're robbing yourself of one of the ways that God speaks to you. God also speaks in, through creation, like Paul says in Romans 1.19. We can see the attributes of God by staring at the beautiful stars at night. We know the vastness that David speaks about and the, the, the greatness of his glory by doing things like looking at the, the, a huge ocean and the way that the waves move and just staring at the stars at night. Watching simple birds remind us that God, if he's going to care for them, he's going to care for us. And then the other way that God speaks was through Jesus. 
Colossians 1, 15 through 20, he's the image of the invisible God. Everything that God is is wrapped up in Jesus. We can know the Father because we can know the Son. And Jesus spoke the Word in a way that we can know the Father. So while we have Samuel speaking out in the midst of a dark culture, God is asking us to speak out the Word of God into a dark culture. We are called to speak out the truth into a dark world because that is a light. We hear God speak to us through multiple ways, but in all the many ways that God speaks to us, this world of judges that looks very much like our world, we cannot forget the invitation that God is giving us to participate. Now look, I I know that when you look into this world, it can seem very dark that most days it doesn't seem like there's a way out and that you can be so overwhelmed with sadness that you essentially quit your responsibilities that God has given you from his kingdom to build his kingdom. And some of you have done that. You've spent multiple years running away from the church or from what God has asked you to do because you've been so overwhelmed with the cares of this world and the cares of this life. But I'm telling you, that doesn't have to be the period at the end of your story. There's never a time where you've gone too far that you cannot hear the voice of God beckoning you and calling you back and through faith ask him to do things on your behalf that you have no power to do for yourself. So, Yes, you have the opportunity to be invited into an incredible sadness like the rest of the world lives in, but you could also be invited into an unbelievable great faith like Hannah, like Samuel, in the midst of one of the darkest cultures ever. We can petition God to change the things that we don't have any control over. And that's one of the biggest lessons I want us to leave from the book of Judges. We started off with a group of people who thought that partial obedience was obedience that doing whatever they wanted in their own eyes as long as they thought was right and didn't violate their own conscience would please God. But we ended with a people who completely forgot God and didn't want anything to do with them. And we don't want to end up in that place, being people who were called by God but want nothing to do with Him. We want to be the people like Hannah and like Samuel, that in the middle of that culture, we can be the people who are using our faith. We're getting up. We're making a difference with our prayers so that God can intervene on a culture that seems completely lost but is not from his perspective. So as we finish this series, I want to just remind you the power of God in your weakness. Yes, there's a lot of things to be sad about, but that's not the end of the story. If you get on your knees and you say, God, use me, you're going to be blown away in the next five to ten years at the ways that he's going to use you. Pray prayers of faith and submit your heart to him and watch him do things that you can't do for yourself. Amen? All right, let's pray.